last week was a lot of fun for me. I, I don't know that it was a lot of fun for you all. Uh, I got to dig into some really neat parts of the text, talk about Enochian literature, and uh, it, it's just, I love the end of 1 Peter chapter 3. And so the goodness that Peter draws on, I think that it should be an eye-opener for us that Peter had books that he read. Paul had books that he read, right? We have to understand that just like we read books, just like the Lord leads us, these gospel writers, biblical authors, they had things in view. They had their own podcasts and their own way. Did you check this tablet out that my man wrote? Did you see this papyri from my man over here in, in this other community? Look what they wrote. Look what they, right? There, there were things that were circulating that they were reading that influenced what they said. Uh, I thought the Lord, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit wrote it. At, holy men of God were moved of the Holy Spirit, but they, they penned it. They authored it. They were writing to uh, the church, to that specific context, so it's important. And I hope that, that you realize that after uh, kind of seeing the end of 1 Peter chapter 3, what Peter had in view. I say all that to say, I don't have time to, to re-preach it, even though I really want to re-preach it right now. I want to pull up last week's outline and do it all over again. Uh, but if you haven't watched last week, is it hot in here? Oh, man, you poor souls. All right. Well, not over there. Yeah, if you guys need to, uh, let's see here. Uh, Rob, can you just do what they did here down that line? And then Mike, can you open these up, please? That one and this one. Let's get some air moving. You know, this is that weird time of year, right, where it's, it's getting warm, thank the Lord. How many are ready for spring? Woo, come on. Hey, if you're, if you're watching online, I have a favor for you. Can you please turn your heat up so that you can join the climate? Turn your heat up to about 85 at home right now. Go ahead, go to your thermostat, do it on your phone, turn it up to 85 so you can join the room. It's really hot in here. All right, just to empathize with us. All right, cool, that'll, that'll get some airflow moving. Okay, what was I talking about? Oh, last week. I'm, so go back and watch last week's message and just dive in and have fun. We talk about angels. We talk about the underworld, all kinds of fun stuff. This, week, this week's message, this is why I love preaching through the Bible, is extremely practical. This is the exact opposite of last week's message. So we're going to dive into chapter 4. We're going to work our way through the passage. But there's five things that I think Peter uh, is hitting on. Remember, 1 Peter, right, the theme of this book is suffering. It's how we walk through this journey. So we've been using this analogy of taking a trip. And, and the question that children ask most when you're on a trip is what? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? So we get the sense that Christians, remember in their environment, uh, we, we have Nero as the emperor. They're walking through extremely difficult, challenging times. And so I, I think rightfully so, these Christians are saying, are we there yet? Is the Lord coming back? Can we put an end to this thing, right? And so Peter says, listen, we're not there yet, but it's okay. Uh, and we've, we've talked about several different things of are we there yet. We've talked about riding in style. We've talked about walking through the turbulent times and, and the suffering. Well, today, um, here's what it is. Are we there yet? No, we're not there yet. Uh, but we're going to give you some tips for the trip. Some tips for the trip. On this journey, chapter 4, Peter makes a transition and he gives all kinds of tips for the trip. So today, it's a practical application towards your spiritual journey. How many, if you could just be given one word or two words today that you know would make your spiritual life easier, you would be ready to receive that. Anyone? Just a, just a word of encouragement. Just, just a, a helpful tidbit. Maybe someone who is a, a stronger Christian, uh, you know, that, that could just offer some pieces of advice for us. Uh, maybe a seasoned marriage that could speak into a young younger marriage today and, and help strengthen that? How many would, would, would invite that into your life, right? Anybody? Yeah, I know I would. That's what today is going to do. Chapter 4 is going to just give you some practical stuff that you can sink your teeth in, that you can use today, tomorrow, this week, the rest of your life, and really just say, you know what? Uh, I, I got what I need. I have what I need. I, I have the strength to continue. I have the strength to walk through these troubled waters. And, and you know what? There's so many Christians online, in person, that I just feel like you don't feel like you have enough. 
So many Christians that feel like you, you literally can't get up tomorrow and get in your spiritual vehicle, good to see you, and take the drive and take the trip. I just can't do it another day, God. God, I don't want to. Can, is there just a cruise control I can put my spiritual life on? Because I just can't handle it. Let me tell you something. Yes, you can. The Lord has equipped you. He has given you his spirit. He has covered you with his blood. And he wants you to live. And he wants you to thrive. And he wants you not just to survive, but to go get it. He wants you on this spiritual journey to be riding in style. And so today, I hope you find the encouragement. How many know sometimes when you set out for a long trip, you have to tell the GPS certain things? Come on now. You have to tell the GPS certain things. Listen, if you're watching Jim and Burn, this is where I got this illustration. Uh, he, they just got that, that new RV, right? And how many want to join Jim and Burn? How many want to take Bethlehem Mobile to Florida next time they snowbird, right? Uh, you hear, come on, we're going. We're going to be a trap. We're going to be like Kanye's church. We're just going to go with Jim and Burn and live stream that junk. It's going to be good. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so. Uh, <laughs> one thing Jim told me, he's like, you know, uh, it's really cool. The GPS that I have, it knows that it's an RV. You put it in there, and it tells you the right path to take so that you don't, like, go under a bridge or un in a tunnel that's too short, right? You have to tell it, give the GPS some tips for the trip. Why? Because driving a big old RV like that, there's going to be certain places that you can't drive with the propane, right? That you could drive with a, a Ford Fiesta. You know what I'm saying, right? So you need to tips for the trip. You, some of you, when you take a trip, how many like to avoid tolls? It's easier on the pocket, right? Come on. I hate, there's like two ways to get to Tennessee from here or even Northwest Indiana to the Midwest. One is through, some of you know what I'm talking about. One is like through PA and everybody talks about how bad Maryland is. Maryland's so bad, I'm going to move to PA. It's like you move to PA and it costs you $50 to drive around in tolls. Let me tell you folks, it's all the same. They get you coming and going. Maryland might be bad, but it's not that bad, okay? Uh, so you take a trip through PA and it's like you're paying 50 bucks just to get through, you know, to get to Ohio. I take the, go through DC, catch 81, shoot down through Virginia, get about three or four tickets through Virginia because I don't know what those cops drink, like what is in their coffee? If you drive through Virginia, don't speed. Like, you know what I mean? Like, gosh. And then they're like, that's reckless driving. I'm like, you should see what I do in my neighborhood. This is not reckless. What is wrong with you people? Anyway, Virginia. God bless you. If you're watching and you're a state trooper from Virginia, lighten up. <laughs> lighten up. Lighten up. Anyway, tips for the trip. Tips for the trip. What way are we going to go? How are we going to travel? What are we going to say in the GPS? What voice do you want the GPS talking? How many like the Australian lady voice? Sorry, babe. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Talk to me like that. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm full of it today. Uh, <laughs> tips for the trip. Tips for the trip. Tip for the trip. Don't make your wife jealous over a GPS voice. That's a tip for the trip. Anyway. Oh, my goodness. Let's get to the word of God, shall we? All right, we're done. Shut it down. Open up the window. I need some more. Woo, it's hot in here. First Peter chapter 4, verse number 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered, and I'm suffering right now. I am suffering. Let's walk in this text. Therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh. Oh, I love the next two words. I love the next two words. Arm yourselves. Tips for the trip. You know where I'm headed with this. Listen, Christ has suffered, therefore. I love that word, therefore, in Scripture. When you see the word, therefore, you need to ask yourself, what is it what? Therefore. What's it there for? We know that the end of chapter 3, Peter just got done saying what it's like to declare your loyalty to Jesus. You know what it's like to get baptized? It's like going to the underworld and saying, yeah, I'm done with you. It was like a Ross thing from friends. I don't know where that came from. I'm done with you, and I'm going up. I am, I'm in the power of the resurrection. Death has no more hold on me. I'm going up. Right? What, what we say when we get saved, when we declare our loyalty to Jesus, that's what it's there for. This is how we should live. When Jesus has radically changed you and translated you from darkness into his marvelous light, things are going to change. Things are going to change around here. So here it is. Therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves. Also with the same understanding. That's a key word there. What time is it? Good Lord. Oh, my goodness. Also with the same understanding. Because the one who suffers in the flesh is finished with sin. 
Mm -hmm. In order to live the remaining time in the flesh, no longer for human desires, but for what? God's will. Boy, if I had a dollar for every time a Christian or a believer said to me, how do I know what God's will is? How do I know? How do I know? How do I know? Okay, this is how you know. Here it is. This is, this is here for you. For there has already been enough time spent in doing what the Gentiles choose to do. Let me tell you what God's will isn't. Carrying on an unrestrained behavior, evil desires, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, lawless idolatry. Here's some tips for the trip. They are surprised that you don't join them in the same flood of wild living. And they slander you. They will give an account to the one who stands ready to judge the living and the dead. There's that end of chapter 3. They will give an account. Verse 6, for this reason, the gospel was also preached to those who were now dead. So that although they might be judged in the flesh according to the human standard, which we talked about last week, they might live in the spirit according to God's standards. All right, here we go. You ready? Tips for the trip. Number one, be armed. Be armed. Look at verse number one. Therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, what is the next two words? Arm yourselves. Arm yourselves with what? What are we going to arm ourselves? How does that work? If you knew in six months, if you got a vision today, and that vision said in six months you're going to get mugged on the street corner, like, literally, it's going to happen. You see the dream, and you know how sometimes you have the dreams that are, like, real? If that, if that happened to you, like, tonight when you went to sleep, you would be like, okay, Google Brazilian jiu-jitsu. <laughs> in six months, I'm about to get wrecked. I could see it in my dream. Training. You'd spend 200 a month, 250 a month. I don't care. I have to arm myself. Why? Because I saw this vision and the Lord made it clear that literally I'm about to get my tail handed to me and they're going to take my wallet, my phone, my keys. They're going to steal it all. If you knew that was going to happen and you knew the appointed time, guess what? You would go train and you would train hard so that when they attacked you, you could what? Defend yourself. But you see, we have a book, we have a thing called the Bible, and we have a roaring lion seeking to devour, and we have appointed unto men, wants to die, and after this, the judgment, but yet we live and we walk like nothing is going to happen, like there's no spiritual warfare, and we never arm ourselves. What's wrong with us? We don't walk through the city. I do some jobs in the city still. You don't walk through the city like with $100. My dad, he's a black belt in karate. And he used to tell a story of his instructor leaving a $100 bill, hanging out of his pocket, and walking like this down the street. You see what's about to happen? And then when they would take the $100 bill, he would take their pride. <laughs> just for fun. I don't condone that behavior. It's just a story that my dad told me. It's probably not even true, Dad, if you're watching. Uh, just kidding. Love you. The point is, is that we arm ourselves. Listen, how do we arm our, you should be asked, if Peter says, listen, it, you know, the theme is suffering, walking through hard times. If there's anything that takes a Christian or a believer out of the game, listen quick, I'm talking quick, it's suffering. You, you know it's coming, it, it's around the corner, the loss of a child, a, a sickness, chronic illness, the loss of a job, a global pandemic, something's happening. John 16, 33, it's gonna happen. Tribulation is here. How, how do you deal with it? But yet we just, oh yeah, mm-hmm. And then when suffering happens, we aren't armed to deal with that problem. How, how what do you think Peter's context was? Here's what I think it is. Hebrews 4, 12. For the word of God is living and effective and sharper than, and, and all my notes are on the program. So if you, if you want this, it's all in the program. For the word, don't read ahead. For the word of God is living and effective. <laughs> if, if you're looking at my notes right now and you know all the ground that I have to cover in 10 minutes, you're praying for me right now in this moment, okay? Because <laughs> I'm like up here and I got, oh, anyway. It, it's living, it's effective, it's sharper than any double-edged sword. When I think of arming myself, the Greek word is huplizo, huplizo, arm yourself. Well, if Peter's using that language, I don't know, maybe Apollos, Paul, whoever wrote Hebrews is probably thinking along the same lines. So they're going to say, there's a sword, and, and with the weight that that word is carrying, 
here's a weapon that you can carry. And, and here's what it does. Sharper than a two-edged sword. Penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Why? Why do we have to arm ourselves with, here's what I'm saying, the word of God. We need to be armed in the word of God. Why? Because this is spiritual warfare. Some of you on the outside, you're doing just fine, but on the inside, you're questioning everything. You're questioning everything. You're scared to death, and it's okay. You're terrified. If that worst fear happens, if that problem happens, if that reversal happens, you're scared to death. How many of you feel, don't raise your hand, how many of you feel defenseless in a moment when life could reverse, when life could turn on a dime? How many of you feel defenseless? Here's what Peter's saying. In a moment where they are getting wrecked for their faith, Peter says this, I'm good. Why? Because I don't feel defenseless, I feel like I could defend through anything because the weapon that I'm carrying. Let me ask you this. How many feel like, this is very important, the weight that this, that this Greek word carries. He says here in verse number one, therefore since Christ also suffered, arm yourselves with the same understanding. Let me ask you this. What theologically, according to the Bible, and some of you this is true right now, are you struggling with? What do you not understand? Many of you don't know what next step to take as a Christian, as a believer. I say that differently for a reason. But, but many of you are str- on the line. You're struggling. What do I do next? Arm yourself. Watch this with understanding. And here's what I would say to you. If there's something that you do not understand, if there's something that is not clear to you, yet in the word of God. This could be one of the most practical things you ever hear this pastor say. Don't stop until you understand it. Don't stop until, watch, it pierces into your soul and it separates the seen from the unseen. In the moment, the word of God, the design of this weapon, you you have to understand, I'm really into guns. I have different guns for different things, different applications, right? I don't have, my AR-15 is not my go-to for home defense because I could defend three houses that way and three houses that way with that bullet. It's the wrong weapon. Many people are, they don't understand what this weapon is for. Here's what the weapon is for. It is for intimately, personally diving into your heart and separating truth from error. What do I do next, pastor? Here's some tips for the trip. Be armed with the word of God. If the word of God is not dividing flesh from spirit, then you are not using the tool. The word of God should lay you wide open where you're just like, oh, all right. If you don't understand, I'm not mad at you. I'm, t- I'm absolutely, listen, don't walk away thinking, pastor's just mad because I don't know enough about the Bible like he knows about the Bible. No. God is using those question marks to propel you towards the tool that will answer it for you. I just, I just need a, another YouTube video. No, you just need the word of God. You know, and, and it's like those people that are tossed with every thought or philosophy or doctrine. That, you know, they don't last in any church longer than six months because it takes six months to hear what they don't want to hear that they heard at the last six places. When the word of God begins to work, here, listen, you have to understand this, that it's time we armed ourselves in the word of God. And what that means, that I submit to you, Peter is drawing from that verse because he's using the same language. It divides in understanding. Some pastors just like to say everything that they're against, right? And maybe that's what God's called them to do, I don't know. But I'm here to say, look, the word of God is is not just telling you everything it's against, The word of God is there for your understanding to complete the circuit. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like as Christians, we take this pro-life issue. We should have a completed circuit on the sanctity of human life because the way we understand it from being image bearers in Christ. That's just one example I understand. Here's the thing. Arm yourself, number one. Be armed in the word of God. Turn to your neighbor and say, be armed be armed in the word of God. Hey, 
Church, what are we arming ourselves in? The what? The word of God. The word of God. Number two, number two. Stay with me. I ain't got time for this. Go to, ver- go to verse number seven. Look at it. Verse number seven. The end. Verse seven to 11. <laughs> see what I did there anyway. Uh, seven to 11, it says, it's talking about the end times specifically. Verse seven, the end of all things is near. Don't miss this. Therefore, <laughs> the end of all times is near. And, and I think he's speaking specifically to the fullness of the Gentiles, to the church doing what the church is supposed to do, reach the ends of the world. These guys just had an ancient Near East context and a context of, like we know he was in Turkey. He didn't know about all those people in Asia and all those people in North America. Peter thought, my philosophy is that we go get after it because the Lord could come back at any minute, right? So if we have that same urgency, knowing that the ends of the world possibly have not been reached yet, the urgency is that we get the gospel out. Like, that's the, the end of times is that we literally share the gospel. That, that's the commission of the Great Commission. So he's saying, in the light of the fact that our journey is a tough one and that we have a huge task of getting the gospel to the world, look at it. Be alert. Be alert. And what? Sober-minded for, what's the next word? Oh, wow, no one has their Bibles. It's okay. I'll tell you. If you want it spoon-fed, bring your Bibles. Come on, no, I'm kidding. Be alert, be sober-minded. Here's what it says, for prayer. For prayer. This is so, ba- this is like the, Mike, this is the roadmaps. This is as basic as it gets. Number one, be armed in the word. Number two, be alert in your time of prayer. It's so simple, isn't it? It's like, this is so simple, but, but yet we don't do it. All right, kids, let's pray for the food. Okay, it's time to go to bed. Let's pray together. Okay, Lord, keep me safe on my way to work. Lord, help me get something out of church this morning. Does it sound like there's some end time urgency of the Lord coming back and actually like working in our life? Like is there actual spiritual warfare? I feel like this is like the the millennial generation, unfortunately. It's like what's a sword? Why do we have to be armed? Can't we all just love each other? No, it doesn't work that way. There's real enemies. The average Christian. I mean, I pray for my food. The thing is, is we're not engaging in actual things that require prayer. So therefore, it doesn't matter. (laughs) Lord, keep my kids safe. The things that you're asking for, they really don't even require that. Like, bad things are going to happen in this world. Disease is going to wreck the world. Like, car accidents happen. Like, all the things that we're praying. The Lord's like, can we just engage on spiritual warfare? Can you be sober-minded for a minute? And, and like, we're intoxicated with safety. We're intoxicated with a spiritual bubble. We're intoxicated with a Western mindset that doesn't understand that there are some places in this world that actually require prayer for spiritual warfare to happen. Tips for the trip. Why don't we, why aren't we actually alert in our prayer time? I think of the disciples who fell asleep. I think of a church in 2021 that has fallen asleep. (sighs) So simple. When was the last time you entered into your prayer time and you were like not just alert, but you were sober? You felt the weight of the presence of God coming into your life and you were asking for things that you know only he could give you. Lord, if we're going to reach our community with the gospel of Christ, I need you in this moment. Thy will be done on earth as it is what? In heaven. I'm pulling heaven resources into my earthly problem. Be alert in prayer. Here's here's a thought. James 5, 16. Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. (laughs) The effectual fervent prayer of, sorry, I went King James. The prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. It's very powerful. <laughs> that was, sorry. Flashback. <laughs> it's very powerful. It, what would happen in the church if we actually prayed for one another to have victory over our sins? Tips for the trip. Go to another believer and say, can you pray with me about this? Can you pray that I can be healed from this? You know, he qualified the entire moment with verse 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, here's what he's saying. 
I may get happy. What time is it? Yeah, I'm going to get happy. Therefore, because of the cross, you know, there's nothing like wasting momentum. There's, there's nothing like, especially in sports, you, know, you get that weakest link, you find it, and it's like everyone else is, especially in pickup basketball, it like really reveals itself in that moment. Sorry if you're not a ba- basketball nerd, but it's like, dude, it's, it's about the basics, right? The whole team's suffering because you can't dribble the ball. Anyway, like if we understood what Jesus did, Being alert and sober is like feeling weight. I, I, I'm, Peter's saying, if you'll be alert in your prayer time, if you'll just understand what the Savior did for you, it will radically change your life. Understand what Jesus did for you. Understand what his blood does for your sins. Get a real good picture of the cross this morning. And you'll get a real good picture of what it's like to have a successful Christian journey through this life. This is going to become even more clear in the next point. But let's listen, church. The reality of the Lord's return should not produce fear and uncertainty, but rather a focused effort on spending more time with the Lord. We got a bunch of kids who are scared about the Lord coming back. What does that mean? What does that look like? If we're seasoned in the word of God as, as older believers, that's wonderful. The Lord is going to redeem every dark place in this earth. I'm ready for it. Even so, come, Lord, quickly take it into your prayer closet, young believer. Christian, when was the last time you sweat in your prayer closet? You labored in that moment where you couldn't move because of the work of the Spirit on your life. I think of a song. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer. (laughs) Let's rewrite that for 20. Can you make that more relevant? Sweet minute before my food, sweet minute before my food. (laughs) Sweet hour. Oh, Let's use a different measuring tool for this song to make it more relevant. We couldn't handle it. What is wrong with us? Man, Pastor, you're being a little rough today. I don't know. Yeah. Hey, hey, let's be armed in the word of God. If you don't understand it, if you don't understand it, you don't get an out. Don't stop until you do. You have the same Bible I have. Read it. Be alert in your prayer time. Carry some weight into that prayer closet this week. I just don't know what to do. I don't know what the Lord's will looks like. You don't know what an hour in prayer looks like. That's why you don't know what the Lord's will is. It's no excuse. Peter is saying, hey, why don't you spend some time on your knees? Or standing or whatever it looks like for you. Or I learned this week, hands open, eyes open. I don't care. Spend some time with the Lord. Number three. Number one, be armed in the what? Man, it's in the word. Number one, be armed in the what? Yes. Number two, be alert in your prayer. Be alert in your what? Prayer. Be alert. Number three. I'll probably have to stop here. Yeah, I will. I'll stop here. We'll do the other ones next week. It's going to mess me all up, Cody. Everything I said about being done. Anyway. Number three, and we'll, we'll end here. Don't just only read to number three in your program. The other two, don't look at them. Number three, be loving in relationships. Tips for the trip. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna be armed with the word of God. I'm gonna be alert in my prayer time. I'm gonna also be loving in my relationships. Look at verse number eight. I love this. Verse number eight. Above all. He's, it doesn't really matter to Peter, does it? I, I didn't think so either. Man, it's all gone. <laughs> Above all, it's probably not that important. Let's not talk about the, we'll, we don't need to talk about this point, do we? Above all. No. We're out of time anyway. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm just kidding. Many of you were like, yes. <laughs> I ain't done. Shoot. I got one more. Above all. 
all. This is very important to Peter. Do you get the sense? Above all, maybe our antenna should go up. Look at it. Maintain constant love for one another. Since, since, oh, oh, I love the way he words it. Since love covers a multitude of what? Okay, all right. Hmm. Above all, we have to be loving. Be alert in prayer, but we have to be loving in our relationships. Why? Because love, here's the word, covers. Aaron and I went this week to uh, a seminary up in, or whatever it was, I'm not sure. Seminaries that were set through some sessions of a mentor of his. And he talked about the sacrifice of what happened when Adam and Eve sinned. (laughs) And it really, like, I heard what he said. I hadn't received it yet. And I've been kind of chewing on it. And it's nothing new. It's the same line here. Therefore, since Christ also suffered. That's, That's what qualifies everything that we need to do, the tips for the trip, are all because of what Jesus did, not what we do, right? That's the whole point. But here's what he said. He said, when Adam and Eve sinned, what did they do? They covered themselves with what they had. I'm paraphrasing, right? The leaves, the vegetation. Remember? Remember the story? The fig leaves, they sewed them together and covered their nakedness because they were aware. But what did the Lord do? The Lord covered them with what? Skins. So what happened in that moment? Sacrifice. It took a sacrifice to cover them. In that moment, they learned, first off, that their actions have devastating effects. That sin required a payment. Sin requires a what? A payment. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is no forgiveness. (laughs) Here's the point. They learned right then and there when they watched something that they loved die for their actions to be covered. The Lord said leaves aren't enough, which he made the point, which I think is a great point. That's why, that's why Cain's offering was despised. Nothing died. Cain is saying my way is better than your way, God. And man has always said that. So therefore, I submit to you that the same spirit in Cain's offering, how it wasn't received, so are the Christians' actions that don't love the brother and sister, that does something against you, or even a brother or sister that isn't in the body of Christ yet, and you don't love them, you're committing the same sin. Here's, here's why I say that. Be loving in relationships. Listen to this. Proverbs 10, 12. Hatred stirs up conflicts. Watch this. Stay with me. But love covers all offenses. But, but isn't there a chapter that, that has everything to do with love, Pastor? Yeah, 1 Corinthians 13. Though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels and have not charity, it profiteth me what? Nothing. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind and envieth not, it vaunteth not itself. It seeketh not her own. There, there's something about this thing of love that, that what? It covers. From the beginning, there has been a display of what covers, and it is love. But that love only comes when there's a sacrifice. You see, in, a mo- in the most practical sense, I can say it to you. To bring the most weight to this, this, this point here is that we have to be loving. Why? It is how we show Jesus to the world. When we look at someone in our workplace that has done us wrong, when we look at a brother or sister in our church that has done us wrong, and we cover them with love instead of anger and hatred and gossip, We are showing the cross. By loving our neighbor, we are saying the blood covers your sins. If Listen, I think of Paul's words. All those things, the fruits of the Spirit are what? Love, joy, peace, all of those amazing things. But he says, 
against such there is no, does anybody remember what the word is there? Law. That word law just means regulation. He's saying as a believer, there is no regulator to the fruits of the Spirit. Let, let me give you another illustration. As a diver, they have an oxygen tank, which means they have limited resources. And what do they need in their mouth? A regulator. I only have a certain amount of oxygen, so I have to control. <laughs> Paul says, as a Christian, as someone who has been covered with the love of Christ, as someone who has seen the illustration of the animal skin, now we take it to the cross, and he was a sacrifice once for all. The blood of Jesus covers all sins, and now what we have an understanding is there is no tank to our love. There is no end to the love of Christ. There is no need for us to regulate it. Take the regulator out. Let someone do you harm over and over and over again. And every time you give them love, over and over and over again, there's no regulator to the fruits of the Spirit. Listen, Peter is saying this. We have to be loving in our relationships because love is what covers. Love was the byproduct of the sacrifice. And we have a bunch of churches that are stripped from the love. How do I know that? We have a bunch of churches that aren't loving each other. I come from those. Many of you have had a background in churches that you didn't feel loved. You didn't feel connected. Those are churches that have left the cross. They've left what that sacrifice has done. He qualifies the whole passage, therefore, since Christ also suffered. Listen, <laughs> this one truth is enough for every marriage to make it. This one truth is enough for every parent to walk their children through every hard time that they're going to see. What do you... That was loud. Stay with me as I, as I close here. <laughs> Love covers all. What Jesus did for us is enough to strengthen our walk. If you're thinking about throwing in the towel, don't. Love covers a multitude of sins. If anyone, if anyone can love somebody, it ought to be someone who has found the love of Christ. If anyone. The tremors that Folks from the church are more judgy and mean and, than anyone else. That ought not be true. Tips for the trip. Be armed with the word of God. If you don't understand it, keep going. Be alert in your prayer time. And number three, be loving in your relationships. You don't know. Your love this week could be just what that person needed. That prayer one toward another, that prayer of a righteous man, of it, so much will come. You don't know. I beg you as the church, this week there could be someone at work, and maybe you need to repent of this. Maybe you've been mean. You've been so worried about you and your position and what you get from your job, and you've missed who you need to be loving. Look, someone's salvation could hang in the balance. You have to, you must be loving in your relationships. When the devil suggests that anger is a better regulator and that you don't need to apply the sacrifice, listen, think about the cross. Tell Jesus it wasn't enough. Tell Jesus that he's not giving you enough love in that moment. It won't happen. Let's submit to the love that God has given us. It's this agape love, this love that transcends our mind. It comes from heaven and is applied to what we need. Every head bowed, every eye closed.